Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Here on a Thursday, which means it's time to recap and go over the most notable things that were said by the K-State coordinators today as they get prepared for their week one matchup with UT Martin. Joe Klanderman and Connor Riley both came, spoke with the media, gave some insight as to what is going on there. And in just a moment, D.Y. will give you the three most notable things from each that he took away from today's press conference. But before we do that, good time to remind everybody that the Wildcats are headed to Dublin, Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your uh, your package now. That's cats2ireland.com. Uh, yeah, I saw, I saw, I think I saw a social media post last night about, uh, seats starting to, to disappear and the good ones. So if you want to be as close to the action, or maybe you have some other really specific way that you want to view the game in Ireland, the best way to do it, jump on it now, cats2ireland.com, get you set up for all of that. So, uh, that is what we have on cats to Ireland today and for the coordinators and kind of the. Cliff notes with those guys, interesting vibes with week one always because you have to dance this line of respecting the opponent, but also internally these guys know there are serious issues if you're having to treat UT Martin like you're playing Oklahoma State or Kansas or whoever else you want to throw out there. Even South Dakota State. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is – I mean, UT Martin is – it, they're they're a fine FCS team, but they're nothing special. They're probably better than each of the last two. I will say, I think they're better than South Dakota and SEMO. Okay, see, I think I thought there was maybe some sentiment that they were not as good as some of those, but I, you know, I, they I did. Think, they blasted SEMO last year. I was going to say one to fourteen. I, they beat SEMO. Yeah, I think we probably gave SEMO a little bit too much credit last year. Was one of the issues because that became. A pretty like what above average at best FCS team probably. I'd have to go back and look, but they got yeah. blasted by UT Martin, of course. And then South Dakota, like they're they are what they are. They're not. And North Dakota State's not even what North Dakota State used to be, but South Dakota is not North Dakota State. So UT Martin is probably like South Dakota two years ago or a little bit better. And what was that score? Thirty four to zero, and that was in the Big Twelve title season. Yeah, so SEMO the year prior going in, they were nine and three. They went five and zero oh, uh, in their conference, but that was what we had to go off of going into last year. SEMO did struggle last year, though. They were four and seven and three yeah. and three in a pretty weak conference. They did beat Lindenwood forty five to seven the week after losing <laughs> to K State, though. So that's just a, that, a little that, note there for you. That, that's another of how much of kind of a joke. That I mean, I understand kind of why KU did it, but Linda Wood's a first year FCS team that KU plays tonight, of course, and they would be underdogs against Pitt State. Yeah, it's 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 a strange deal. Uh, <laughs> Linden Wood is not very good at this thing, but yeah, you laid it out pretty nicely. Uh, wh why you think they've been able to make this jump to us last night? Yeah, uh, so UT Martin may be better than the last couple of FCS opponents. Yep. Still somebody K-State should win yep. against by a lot of points, especially with what you think they're going to put on the field defensively. Uh, let's start on the defensive side of the ball. What stood out to you about what Joe Klanderman had to say? I'll begin by what's – because I'm, like, paying attention to sometimes – you just got to pay attention with great minute detail. You can, like, pick out some Easter eggs. And I think they have a – what I will say is they respect the interior of the UT Martin offensive line. I think they view that – as probably the strength across the board for this team. And that the, usually, I mean, FCS teams, what their problem is, typically they don't have depth and they only have one or two spots that maybe can kind of go mano a mano a little bit with you. Um, and where that is for UT Martin is the interior of the, uh, their offensive line. So I think they'll probably game plan around that a little bit, obviously. I think we heard that from Brendan Mott and we heard it again today. From Joe Klanerman, the defensive coordinator for Kansas State. So I think I'll take them at the word here because there's always, I mean, good FCS schools have one or two good spots. I think it's the interior of the UT Martin offensive line um, to think about. But again, 
At the same time, they did lose their best running back who transferred to Oklahoma. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting things about UT Martin. I, I've been probably more than I've ever done in my life uh, going and getting ready for UT Martin since uh, Mitch has bestowed the lofty role of being Cole Manbeck on Powercat oh. Game Day for me. <laughs> so I have to – and I remember – when I when I did it in 2019 at the Liberty Bowl, John was like, "Yeah, Cole will just rattle off all this stuff at one point. I'll give it to him." And so I put together like two full pages on Navy and was ready to use it, and we never got to it. But yeah. I did uh, I did see some of the the notes about UT Martin's offense, which is honestly to me probably the most fascinating aspect of UT Martin and they bring back all three of their top receivers from last year, which is probably a good thing for these safeties uh, to really get to, you know, see what they'll do in game number one. And I know Joe Klanderman had praise for them today. Yeah. So, so you're the prior, what Cole Manbeck was for power cat game day. You're the power cat game day, Cole Manbeck or KSO's KSU underscore fan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm less statty about it. Uh, and definitely will not understand some of the things that fans throwing out there. Uh, but yeah, I, it's, it's the most research I've ever done on, on an FCS opponent. So, uh, just know that if this comes down to a field goal, UT Martin's breaking in a new kicker this year because they lost theirs to Kentucky in the off season. So wow, that's they have a few P four transfers. Good for them. They, yeah. Or, or, I mean, maybe we're fortunate that some of those guys left. Yeah, no, yeah, they, they lost their kicker. Uh, they lost their running back. Uh, and, and, and that then, running back is, uh, I think, an or at the one line on the Oklahoma depth chart. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, the they brought in a backup running back from Vandy last year where he's had two 350-plus yard seasons in the SEC. So uh, I don't, you know, you're running back at Vandy. I'm not too worried about you, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we can get back to focusing on the Cats instead of UT Martin here. We'll have plenty of time to do that. Uh, tomorrow with our game preview and everything that goes into that. But uh, what else from Joe Klanderman did you have? The question I had were, you know, I'm going to brag. The only time he said good question was me. <laughs> I asked him day one of camp till now, a player or a position group. So I gave him the out. Of course, he went position group, right? You don't want to pick player. But that's why I did it to get a legitimate answer. So if he, and if he went player, it would have blown me away, right? So you, you can have your own takeaways based on which route he likes to take. And obviously he took, you know, which one has improved the most day one to now. And it was interesting. He kind of like did the, like, you know, when you, they say the teacher and when you're in grade school and you're doing a math problem, show your work, he kind of showed his work. He's like, well, the DNs is so competitive, so I don't go there. So I was like, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> an interesting nonetheless. Wait, wait, so the DNs are so competitive and you asked about, most improvement from day one so i said most improvement from day one and he's like well i won't go dns because it's just been the most competitive room hmm. well that i mean that that makes me feel worse about the dns now i'm not <laughs> it, it, too far into anything but that makes me think that they've all just been competing and not getting better yeah it was a, it was a, yeah i didn't know how to take that part of the answer like i said it was like a math problem where he was showing his work and then he ultimately got to the corners not that and not necessarily Keaton Garber and Jakey Parrish. He said, he, we know what we have from them. But he wasn't sure where the depth was. It was basically a wide-open competition. You know, we had brought in this Rice transfer, Jordan Dunbar, but he wasn't here for spring, so what's he about? Um, Justice James, we know what he's about, but he hasn't really gone out and had to do it yet because of the guys in front of him. And then uh, Donovan McIntosh, Kenigel Thomas, he said, I felt like at the beginning of training camp we knew we had two and then we then we knew that maybe we have a three maybe we have a four maybe we have a five he said now i'm in front of you today i know we have a one i know we have a two but i also know we have a three four five interesting that the yeah. five wasn't canadial thomas it's donovan mcintosh i uh, to me that is really encouraging to hear because that was one of the areas that i, I don't know if we talked about it a week or two ago um but we were talking about, you know, which which position coach maybe had the most work to do. And I, I had a little bit of concern uh, about the, the corner situation because, well, number one, you're going to use more than two corners in a game. We know that K-State in the last couple of years, they have had some health struggles at corner, especially that 2022 season. And, like, 
in the Big 12, your corners are going to get worked a lot. So you're going to have to keep guys fresh any way you can. So I was worried about what would come behind it. Um, but to hear Joe Klanderman actually say, hey, we have this plan in place. We feel good about these guys. That should be really encouraging to K-State fans. So uh, I I would echo what you're saying. That is very good news for the K-State defense, which it feels like another rich getting richer situation. We know this defense is going to be really good. We know that they already have a ton of depth. Now we know there's even more depth in some of the spots that we didn't even know was there. And I would say, or even between the lines, when you hear, like I said, if you pay attention to some of just the small things in every interview, whether it's a player or a coach, a guy coming on fast and furious is Jordan Dunbar. Does it feel like to you that Jordan Dunbar is going to, I mean, we know that Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish are really good, but is Jordan Dunbar going to do enough and be good enough to kind of force his way onto the field more often than just in a, hey, we need to give these two guys a breather. Like, we want you to go out there and make plays for us. Yeah, there's a chance where, he, you know, you almost had like three starterish corners last year with Garber, Parrish, and Will Lee. Um, obviously, we know what Will Lee kind of checked out towards the finish of the season. But I think they they obviously want a guy like that. I think they feel like they have two guys like that. Like, Justice James is probably number three, but I don't know how, and, and this is no fault of his own. I think Dunbar is coming on so fast and furious that I don't know that he's not the number three at some point. I I feel really good about where they are in the quarterback room. Yeah, that's uh, that's encouraging to hear. Okay, anything else from Joe Klanderman uh, that stood out to you? Point number three. I actually thought of a fourth point, but we can no. On. You can hit on hit on both of them because uh, look, you know me. I'm I'm a Joe Klanderman guy. I like to hear it all. Yeah, and it was just like some things jarring loose uh, of just like being in the room too. You can kind of get a facial expression. And then if you also have some inside intel behind that, you can probably draw some conclusions, right? So I'll get to that on my fourth, we'll call it a bonus one. And we'll actually go to Connor Riley and come back to it about that. Um, Austin Romain, I think, is a real – If Joe Klanderman, I won't say I know it because I haven't seen it, but Joe Klanderman thinks – Austin Romain is the real deal. And Austin Moore, when I talked to him on Monday, thinks Austin Romain is the real deal. And based on things that I had heard a few weeks ago, maybe at the beginning of training camp, maybe after one week, two weeks, you know, I, I've shared this, you know, and, and if you're not a KSO member, this is a little bit of a taste of maybe what you would get if you were a member. Um, so a little nugget that's going out here for free to almost like an advertisement deal here. And by the way, kick off 24, um, 50% off uh, your membership at KSO right now. So if you're not doing that promo code, kick off 24, do it. And here's an example. We were told earlier in camp that Austin remain at one point had been the most impressive linebacker at training camp. And you add that to what Austin remains or Austin Moore said about Austin remain on Monday. I basically asked him, has Austin remain proven to you that he's ready to be a starting Mike linebacker? Cause he's the guy. And he said, yeah, he didn't prove it to me in training camp. He proved it to me in March and April during spring ball. And he asked Joe Kleinerman today. He's like, he's night and day ahead of where he was last year. So um, we'll get to make our own conclusions about Austin remain, right? The next few yeah. weeks. And I'm sure the fans will as well, but to a man, and I think it's genuine and you, you can let me know what you think because you, you're in the room on a lot of these two and you can kind of tell when they're kind of blowing hot air when they're not. I think there's full belief in Austin Remain this year. I think there is. I think we've heard that come up enough. It seems like the sentiment now for the last couple of weeks has been he is going to get the first crack at being the Mike this year. So mm -hmm. I, I, totally, I totally believe what they're saying about Austin Remain. Right I now. believe he, get, he would get that crack against UT Martin on Saturday, even if Alec Marenko was healthy. Yeah. Yeah, that, I yes. Was, I think there was concern early on, you know, that first uh, practice or whatever, people were like, where's Alec Marenko? And then it was like, okay, Romaine's getting that opportunity. It, it's talked like it, Romaine has made this improvement to get this role regardless. Okay, flipping sides of the ball, Connor Riley going to be uh, in a unique role this year, something he's never done. He will be the offensive coordinator. He's also going to have to manage 
being upstairs in the booth and then having his co-OC and quarterbacks coach Matt Wells down on the field. In-helmet communication was brought up, everything else uh, today. What what stood out to you about what Connor Riley had to say? I'll start there when you talked about the in-helmet communication. That was my question, and they seem to feel comfortable about where that operation is to this day. But it sounded like what was the work in progress was the tablets on the sideline this year. Um basically learning the technology that's in it and what little things that they can do to utilize to help them and also to determine what's actually helpful and what's going to be a waste of time and not necessarily functional for them. Yeah, that's good. I mean, so at, at Big 12 Media Day, I don't know if you made it over there, but they had the the DV Sport and Microsoft guys there with the, the surfaces and like Drew and I were hands on. We got to mess with them and see exactly what the teams are going to see. And it was kind of fascinating to use, but like first crack at it, I, you know, I'm somewhat young still. I'm 26. Uh, I think you put technology in front of me. I know how to use a tablet. I know how to use a phone. Like I, I may not have used that specific thing before, but I generally know how to do some of this. And there was a little bit of a learning curve to it where and, you were trying to figure out what to press, where to go, how you do certain things. And every couple of minutes, you would discover something new and you would use that. But then these guys are having to think in the back of their head, okay, but how is this applicable to what we need? Like, let's yep. not get caught up with some of these features. Yeah, let's not get tied up in some of these things that aren't necessarily going to help us. Or, hey, look at this. This is what's going to help us. Let's 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 dive in to this. And th this is kind of new. It doesn't make sense to me, like why they didn't get it sooner. Um, maybe like day one of fall camp, they didn't get these tablets to work with until ten or eleven days ago. Well, because Big Bad Brett was still trying to work out his uh, exclusive partnership with Microsoft or whatever, or, or probably UConn. or UConn. Yeah, or UConn. <laughs> yeah. Well, either of those. Uh, We'll see. We'll see if those were wise decisions to partner with either UConn or Microsoft. Uh, yeah, I, that's uh, whatever on that one. So that will be fascinating to see, kind of how they use it, and and that'll be something because I'll be down on the field getting highlights and stuff. That I'll probably, you know, every time I'm walking by to change end zones or something, I'm looking to hear or see what I can going by, and it'll be fascinating to see how many guys are using them, how they're, you know, kind of going about it in that area. So I'll I'll be interested in that on Saturday. Two things, uh, Brett Yormark, apparently an Xbox guy. So that's what we know now. Also, which K State player will be the first one to spike a tablet and break Ooh, that thing like Tom Brady style? That is a great question. Huh. I don't I don't know that I picture it being anybody on offense right now. Oh, um, you know if it was an offensive player, the guy that's kind of got like. Like that about him might be like Jace Brown. I could see. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, Avery's too composed. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Think, I don't think it would be Avery. I, I really don't think it would be any of the offensive linemen this I, year. I, I don't think any. Um, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think the offensive linemen like are into the tablets that much, even in the NFL game. Am I wrong? Uh, so in the NFL game, I know that they aren't because they can kind of lie to you because in the NFL, this was the thing Drew and I found out they don't actually get to use the video on there. They, they still picture. get like three or four pictures from a play. And so that's where like, you can't really tell what to do or where somebody screwed up offensive line wise with pictures. So QB so, receiver. Yeah. Yeah. So they might, they might be more effective at this level since they're going to get video for it. Uh, I mean, if it was like six years ago, Dalton Reisner would have been a candidate to me to spike a tablet. Um, I'm not giving a thumbs up to to, <laughs> to that. Um, man, I don't I don't offensive player to I don't think Wait, an offensive geez. guy does it. Defensively, um I could see maybe Oh, I know one. Um man, I that, that I see I just don't like it's not gonna be Austin Moore. No, I don't that's think, who I think it is. Oh, you they, think it's Austin Moore, cause really? Because they, they say like apparently he was the one that they had to pull from a game last year because he was talking so much shit with the opposing player that he almost got flagged. Like he was, they were getting after it. Well, like, I, like if you, if you talk to Austin Moore off the field, absolutely not. But he's one of those dudes that there's a switch that flips and he is absolutely I mean, insane when he's on the football field. The machine wouldn't dare hurt one of his cousins. Would he? Uh, maybe when he comes off the field, maybe that's an off field moment. So maybe he won't do that. But yeah, 
Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I I had not heard that, and uh, I would not have anticipated although, although that. Joe Clarion also mentioned that uh, two of his best leaders are the linebackers, right? Austin Moore and Desper Purnell. He said Austin Moore, everyone knows, is probably our maybe our best or most exceptional leader. He said, but Desmond Purnell is right there. <laughs> he said, Desmond Purnell is just our confrontational leader. <laughs> Basically, yeah. the, the one that'll rip your ass. That's what it sounds like. Makes sense. Uh, well, let's let's talk about Des Purnell uh, uh, when we get back to defense because you had some other things there, and I want to circle back to that. Uh, offensively, though, post-talking technology, what else did uh, Connor Riley have to say about his team and the way things are going for preparation of this game on Saturday? You hear a lot about teams, or at least we have takeaways a lot of times from week one when you play an inferior opponent, and you're like, well, they were really vanilla. It felt to me when Connor Ali was asked about maybe this approach to this game that he basically admitted, hey, we're going to be vanilla. Um, he didn't say it in those exact words, but keeping it pretty simple, pretty buttoned up. And it sounded like he wanted to do that because he, know he, he, had, he knows he has an inexperienced group in a young group. So he wanted to almost keep it simple for them, not really to keep things away from the future opponents but to let them play a little bit faster and kind of grow into the moment, it sounded like. And and also, I just think he just didn't want to complicate things for them so they could just, play, like I said, play fast, but execute at a high level was another word. So you can execute easier. You can probably play faster if you don't have like so much going on. So it sounded like you wanted them to be able to ease into the moment. You know, that, that's kind of interesting to to hear, but it makes sense for all the reasons you stated. And also, you can do it in a game like this and make it almost more of like a challenge to your guys with, we don't need to do the, you know, the special thing to win this game, but if we just go out there and attack and handle business like we should and everything that we do by the books, we should be able to kind of overpower and dominate this opponent. And I think that's I think that's a good approach. Uh, to everything going on. So uh, I understand where he's coming from there. And certainly the more vanilla you keep it in a game like this too, you're going to get a better understanding of what guys can do what. And this is an offense that needs to kind of learn what guys can do what. You know, you're breaking in a new starting tight end in Garrett Oakley, which is important to you. There are a lot of receivers that are likely to get opportunities that you're trying to figure out, okay, who are we going to be able to trust by week two, week three, when we're on the road at Tulane or a big game at home against Arizona? Uh, so I, I actually think that's the right approach for this game because uh, you're going to get a better feel for your team if you play it like that as opposed to they've got the talent to where if they really want to get into the weeds and trick it up, uh, they can confuse the hell out of UT Martin. But and, that's and not good it, for them or anybody. And perhaps themselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then my, had three, we talked about three points apiece. Point number three, I would go, you know, I asked Coach Riley, you know, how he felt about the way that John Pistori and Andrew Langing, because those we knew those were guys number six and seven, how they were able to push, quote unquote, that first group. And – and it was nothing against Pastore. I think he's going to play quite a bit still, too, this year and be in that rotation. But he seemed more inclined to want to talk about Lion Gang. So I think Lion Gang is the one that really, really pushed. Uh, probably won't start, but with how hard he's pushing, how well he's looked, like it seems like they're really torn on, like, don't start Lion Gang, start Lion Gang. You know, he's already a junior. Like, he is deserving to start. But Taylor Portier has also give every ounce – of sweat and blood his entire career in Manhattan to them wanting to afford him the opportunity first is what it almost feels like to me. Yeah, that I, I, I like that. I get that approach. And it seems like, you know, you talk about depth developing with the corners. They think that's progressing a little bit better with the offensive line, but they're, still, still yeah. seem pretty sturdy in that, hey, it's these seven guys. They're and not as deep. Looking for more. And it makes sense because of what they lost from last yeah. year's team. They're not as deep at off. He admitted it. They're not as deep at offensive line this year as they were in 22 and 23. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Uh, circling back to the defense, you had another point there, and I was going to ask you about Des Purnell because I know that he got 
explicitly mentioned and maybe some different uh, things they might try with him this year. And you talked about, you know, the two leaders at linebacker. Um, As we get closer to the start of this season, does it feel more and more like we know Des Purnell is good. We know he was going to have a good season, but are expectations going even higher for him as we sit here now? uh, What it would be almost 48 hours from kickoff. I don't really sense too much of a change. And I kind of went into this off season and season thinking that he could already contend for all big 12 status. I, I think pretty highly of him. I think pretty convincingly he was the best linebacker last year. I mean, Daniel green went down in game two. Yeah. Austin Moore. I think I wonder if it was a little bit of injuries with him, but he hit some kind of wall there towards the end and wasn't as good as he was the year prior. And I still like Austin more, but it just I thought we left last year with Des Purnell as the best linebacker on the team. So I, I still feel that way. Okay. And and my, my last note is something that kind of jarred loose, and I'm sure I'll write about it on KSO here in the near future. And I don't know that they yeah, and you know I think uh, they they've been covering this up a little I say covering it up, but like, you know, being careful with this information. They always are a little bit with injuries, but even unprovoked, Chris Klein said that they were dealing with a few things when he was talking on Monday that I've a handful of guys, maybe a handful is too much. Maybe two or three guys were going to be questionable. It sounded like, um, nothing long-term, maybe short-term. And I, and I've heard some things that like, I don't, unfortunately like the bad luck spot of last year too, right? The linebacker position. I've heard some things there and here in, like Joe Klanderman, I think the way he talked about Asa Newsom, I think he was having a hard time finding the words. It wouldn't surprise me if he was one of those guys um, that Chris Kleiman was alluding to on Monday that mm. you know could be questionable. Hmm. That's interesting to think about, uh, especially since it seemed like things were maybe trending in a really good spot there for the start of the season for Asa Newsom in terms of his health. So uh, definitely something to monitor and follow as we get closer to kickoff on Saturday. So, That will do it for us here today, at least for this part. If you're watching it before 8 o'clock at night, make sure uh, that you tune in on the YouTube. We'll be live later this evening, going around, answering your questions, kind of just hanging out, talking whatever about K-State, Big 12 college football as we sit around and also watch the games kicking off tonight, just like the rest of you. Going to have a pretty good lineup of guests joining us throughout the show as well, uh, so you can get a bunch of different opinions and probably see people act differently based on who's joining us uh, and everything else going on there. So that will go on tonight on the KSO YouTube page starting at eight o'clock as we watch the games with everyone. And then tomorrow, DY and I will have our preview for the game. We'll also have best bets back. I will do a better job of tracking them this year. Uh, But I will say, I think DY kicked my butt last year in those. I think so. Uh, so, (laughs) I was on a heater there for a while. Yeah, he had a pretty good stretch there. Uh, So we'll have those for you tomorrow. And then Saturday, uh, you'll get to consume everything that you need to build up for K-State and UT Martin over at K-State Online. So find on three. Make sure that you're using the special code to get 50% off because you have minimal time left to use that it's extended through friday so get on over there and uh dylan and use it up. dylan edwards anytime touchdown probably at any odds i would take if it ever becomes mm-hmm. available okay what about sterling lockett uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you you try that if you want you, you never that, know that's my that's that's my uh like inflammatory thing uh that i've been saying What's to get people's ears you just go oh hey okay best bet, best bet. Now, I don't know that I'm going to say that, but uh, yeah, go over there to KSO, find on three, promo code KICKOFF24 if you want 50% off your first year. Uh, I will say last year when it came to first touchdowns and everything or scoring, I looked in the morning before the game started, I wanted to put money on Dylan Edwards scoring a touchdown for Colorado, and they did not give Dylan Edwards odds. And then he went, what, went and ripped off three or four of them in the game against TCU. TCU. Yeah. Uh, so that really frustrated me. And then the next week, he was like minus 170 or something to score a <laughs> they touchdown. They never gave you a chance. Yeah. And then he only scored like three more touchdowns the rest of the season. So uh, that uh, I do think Dylan Edwards scores a lot of touchdowns this year for K-State. And uh, I would agree that's probably something for people to look out for. So, all right. 
That'll do it for us. We're out of here for Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Kickoff 24 for 50% off at KSO right now until Friday. We'll talk to you later tonight.